many people don't realize that much of western Oklahoma is actually a forest. And I'm walking through what is called an oak shinnery. And joining me today to tell us about the shinnery is Brian Heine Hello. with the uh, U.S. Forest Service here at the um, Black Kettle National Grasslands. Thanks for joining You're us today. You're welcome. You're welcome. Can you tell me a little bit more about the shinnery? Yeah, basically uh, the genus species is Quercus hervardii. Mm -hmm. um, it's been out here for millions of years. Mm -hmm. It basically grows traditionally 150 years ago when we had fire and Native Americans burning and buffalo grazing. It burned or grew to knee high, shin high, mm -hmm. hence the name of it. And now, without the lack of, with the lack of fire, we get something that looks like this behind us, mm -hmm. which is an area that hasn't been burned to our knowledge in the last, at least last 50 years. Okay. And this that we're standing here has burned. Okay. So it's actually been burned three or four times in the last eight years. Okay. Eight to 10 years. So and the, the shinnery grows in an interesting way. Yes. It sends out rhizomes. Yeah, um, it'll basically grow in a clump and you can kind of get an example of that back here behind us mm -hmm. in what we call the shinnery monts. But they might be anywhere from a third of an acre to a half an acre to a little bit smaller and during the fall you can really see the difference when it starts the leaves start changing colors you know each little area will have different color leaves okay and so it's really really pretty and interesting at that point okay and now right now we're in the middle of a research uh plot. yes yes you want to tell it's us some that, of that actually we're doing a fire effects research with oklahoma state university which terry bidwell started back in 95 mm -hmm. so we've been going what 13 years now and what it is we burn every three to five years mm -hmm. on these half acre blocks we've got a couple areas that haven't ever been burned so we can see the effects of lack of fire okay and it's pretty interesting the first year after the fire of course it completely consumes everything out here okay and top kills all the shinnery doesn't take much fire to do that and the first year of course you've got a lot of bare ground and your shinnery grows back slowly mm -hmm. and if it's a good year wet year the grass will outcompete the shinnery and actually shade it out to some degree okay so the grass overtops the shinnery kind of like in this plot we're seeing here uh -huh. for approximately four or five years and then slowly the shinnery will start out competing the grass again and we have to burn it again you know originally we thought we needed to burn everything in april okay. every two years but as the research goes along and the number of years we've done it basically we've found that any burn, any time is good. So they're all really starting to look really similar. Okay. Which is good, you know, yeah. really opens up your burn window versus two weeks. Now you can do it three or four months out of the year. Excellent. And what other different plants do you see come back after the burn? You know, after the burn, we really get an influx of forbs. We call forbs, a lot of people call them weeds. Wildflowers. Wildflowers, you bet. But you yeah. basically open up that ground, which is really beneficial to ground nesting birds and you know stuff that lives on the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, you imagine you're a baby quail this big and you lay down and try to look through that grass right now and it's just too thick for them to do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, after a burn they can really move around and, and forage for little grasshoppers and find seeds and stuff like that. So it's really beneficial the first several years for brood rearing habitat for, for birds. And then over the years, you know, the first year it wouldn't be nesting habitat because the grass is just not dense enough. Okay. But by the second year, the grass is starting to get more dense. You know, it's starting to close in a little bit, but then you have good nesting cover. Okay. So you really need a whole, sort of many like different pasture. cereal stages of your grass and your pasture yeah. out there. So, you know, they have all their life cycles at present in one place. It's really interesting too, is this small little oak also produces uh, a lot of seed, a lot of acorns. Yes, they do. Good, good and food for wildlife. They're pretty good sized. You know, you think a little bitty plant would have a little bitty acorn, but they're really good size, you know, mm -hmm. size of a quarter or something like that. Excellent. Now, I think when you pointed out that one shinnery uh, is actually a plant, you know, that there's these big groups mm -hmm. of plants, if somebody has some of this on their property, that you have to take into account that if yes. you do something at one end, it's gonna affect the you whole. You bet, yeah, if you say you wanna get rid of this little bitty patch here and put a little bit of herbicide, well, you might kill mm -hmm. an acre of it instead of just that one area you wanted, so you gotta be real careful there. Okay, well, let's look at some of the other plant life uh, in this area.
This is the Oklahoma plum, which is a little bit different than the plum most people are used for around here. The sand plum, mm -hmm. which grows in a larger clump, and you know it might be eight or ten foot tall, you know maybe fifty foot across. This mm -hmm. is of course the Oklahoma plum, and it's more of a, a lower profile plant, a single plant, and they're more scattered throughout all this shinery. And we actually see it increasing in here with fire and also with dormant season grazing when we don't graze during the summer okay. year all the time. And the fruits, they're edible? Yes, they are. Okay. How they'll large get, do they get? They'll get a little bit bigger. They're probably not quite as big as the sand plum. Okay. But they are edible. That's good. This is another tree for uh, western Oklahoma. This is the Texas walnut? Yes. And uh, you want to tell us a little bit about this? Uh, generally, it's a little bit smaller than the, the black walnut. Mm -hmm. It grows in better soils, bottomlands, riparian type areas, but it's also, you know, a really hardy tree. Of course, it's grown in western Oklahoma, so it has to be. Yeah. But, and you were saying it makes a pretty good shade tree. Yeah, so nice choice for uh, maybe an alternative tree to grow in western Oklahoma. I thought we'd take a look at one more tree. Um, this one, I'm really attracted to the dark bark. I think it's really pretty. And this is the Chittim wood? Yes, yes. Um, it's one of my favorite trees. It has a berry on it when it matures. It's purple in color. Wildlife really like it. And it seems to be a really hardy tree. And you don't see a whole lot of them in this area, but you know, and this is actually, for this part of the world, a really big one. You usually don't see them quite that big. They're more like, 10 to 12 inches in diameter, not this tall. Okay, it's very nice. Very yeah, nice it is a tree. neat tree. Excellent. Well, thank you for showing well, us all welcome. these trees. I think when people think of Western Oklahoma, they think of grasses and exactly. not Exactly, short the grass woodies. and flat. And we do have a little bit of topography out here and different yeah, species. So it's very nice. I'm glad you all came out here. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.